Okay, great. So welcome to Brian's master project presentation. Uh, okay, so Brian has been working in our group for uh, for how long? Pretty long, right? Like two years? Yeah, since uh, 2019. Yeah, so it has been a very long time and Brian has worked on two projects. And uh, today he will talk about uh, the event driven lower power wireless sensor network over LoRa. Uh, okay. And uh, so now, uh, Brian, you can get started. And let me allow you to share the screen. Sorry about that. Okay, great. You can get started. All right. Let's see here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming, showing up. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. But uh, yeah, this is my project, which is on an event-driven low-power wireless sensor network over LoRa. So this is a part of a uh, greater project between the, uh, as a part of the uh, ARPA-E program here at the U. So here's a quick table of contents for my slides. Uh, just going to give a quick introduction, go over some of the hardware communication um, and the software. And we'll discuss some of the methods that we've been using to test and some of the conclusions that we've come through uh, as we go through each of these pieces. So the RPE group and introduction, uh, those of you here already know what this is, but um, I joined on early in 2019. It's made up of multiple student groups and working with researchers at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So the project and the motivation Right. Is this sorry, sorry for the interruption. I think there's some small noise on your voice. Like when you talk, yeah, there maybe it touches something. Oh, really? Um, is it like there's background noise or it's kind of? Yeah, it's not background noise. I think it's your Mac. So when you speak, so there is a, this kind of small sound. Let's see, is that any better? Yeah, no, I don't hear that anymore. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Let me know if it's too quiet or something. Oh, it, it comes back again. Oh, really? Um, There's like. Uh, uh, this has happened before. Just one second. <laughs> no problem. Take your time. So I will process the video later on. So, I mean, this will not be shown on YouTube. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Is that any better or is it the same? Yeah, no, I don't hear that. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me know if it comes back again. I may need to restart or something. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So we'll go through the uh, project and motivation and yeah, let me know if that something weird happens. So this project that I joined onto, uh, sponsored by RPE. Uh, even though those of you here already know, but it's a, its main goal is to help out farmers. So farmers rely on periodic uh, visual inspections of crops to detect problems. So these could be problems such as insects, weeds, pathogen outbreaks, anything like that. And the way they detect these problems is they literally have to drive around, um, inspect crops visually periodically, make sure that everything is okay. This means that it can be difficult to catch these problems pretty quickly. And they also waste some time, um, they waste a lot of diesel. It's inefficient use of resources, essentially. A possible solution to this problem could just be uh, adding sensors. So sensors could be used to detect problems in a timely fashion. Um, one of these, these sensors would have to be sensitive to um, certain aspects of the environment. And one of those aspects is gas that's released when a plant is harmed. And so the main gas that we're detecting is hexanol. However, there are other gases that we can detect as well. Um, with this network, the sensor network alerts could be sent to the farmer over the internet. This means that the farmer could easily and really quickly understand when there's a problem in their field and catch this problem um, a lot faster than normal and possibly save more crops than they could with regular visual inspections. 
However, there's some aspects to the sensor network that are critical and needs to be low power. And essentially that's just so that sensor device batteries need to last a, a full season. Um, it would be more inconvenient, I believe, to have to be constantly replacing batteries periodically and sensors are having them die and miss notifications. It'd be unreliable. In addition, these sensors need to communicate over long distances and suboptimal conditions. So our project proposes that we use event-driven um, devices to send power or to, to send messages. And so that means that these devices only wake when gas is detected. So uh, here's one of the sensors that uh, has been developed by other students in this group. Um, there's analog circuitry to amplify the sensor designed by other students. And then these sensor readings are brought to essentially me and my project, which is network communication. And that is designed and implemented by me uh, with Professor Mingyuji. So here's some of the details on this project. These sensor devices will be placed around in various places around the field. When the gas is detected, the sensors will send a signal through this analog circuitry designed by the other, designed by the other students to a, a, a gateway through a sensor device to a gateway device. This gateway sends information over the internet for notifications and logging. And these are, as I mentioned before, event-driven. So they are only awake and sending messages if gas is detected. Otherwise, they're in a dormant and sleep state. That is to conserve power. So here's essentially just a visualization of what that might look like. Sensors scattered around the field. And when they detect something, they will send a message to the gateway device, this uh, hexagon here. So here's some technical goals for the sensor device. So that would be these devices, the S in the field. They need to be small sized, battery powered for easy placement, easy recovery. Uh, these will have to be placed, recovered, possibly have the battery replaced every season. Um, they'll need to be long range, be able to transmit across the entire field and in um, unoptimal, suboptimal conditions, such as through tall plants in high humidity, possibly the rain um, in cold environments and hot environments. And they also need reliable communications. So we need to avoid lost messages. It could be a very bad situation for the farmer if they're relying upon these sensors and just a single message is missed because say it was cold out or there's too much humidity and a message couldn't get through. Now for the gateway device, some technical goals are just that it needs wireless communications and battery powered. Essentially fields aren't designed to have uh, power to them or to have you know, a Wi-Fi network or something. Uh, connected to them. So it's necessary for all these devices to be wirelessly connected and um, battery powered. Now for the sensor network, just general technical goals, uh, we'll, or for the server side, general technical goals, we'll need uh, data logging, viewing, and notifications, which is simpler and already established and will be easier once the, now the messages already get to the internet. So I'll go over some of the hardware um, that we've used and implemented these things with. So when I first joined the project, Zigbee was chosen as the initial technology. Zigbee is a mesh network standard. It operates on the 2.4 gigahertz band and it has some advantages. It can go over long distances through the mesh network. So that means multiple hops over nodes. However, it has some disadvantages, um, point to point dis uh, communication distance is low because of the 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, there's high power consumption because it's always on. Transmission through plants with humid weather is suboptimal, again, due to the 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, eventually, we found LoRa. So LoRa is a physical layer RF modulation technology. Uh, it's developed by this company called Semtech. Our implementation of LoRa runs at 915 megahertz. So this is a uh, lower frequency band. This allows communication over long distances. And in addition, the uh, more recent modulation technology allows communication over longer distances with the same power as other schemes, so such as FSK or OOK. This is important as we want as low power as we can for any communication that happens in the field. Um, however, one of the disadvantages is that to get this long range communication, 
we need to slow down the bit rate of the chip so it can be slow to communicate a lot of data. And we'll come back to that later. So uh, after field testing both modules, we found, of course, that the LoRa module, the uh, lower frequency module, was able to communicate farther distances more reliably. And here's some just some photos of the field where it was tested at. This is important, I think, to know that um, this technology that we're using, LoRa, is um, a newer technology, and not many devices or protocols have been implemented with it. And it, it will be interesting to find out what we can do with it. So the hardware for the sensor device. So just as a quick reminder, the sensor device is the device that's sitting in the field over here. Uh, it needs to be battery powered, detects the gas, it sends messages over LoRa, and it sleeps when gas is not detected, also referring to it as the end node occasionally. This is the block diagram for the sensor device. Essentially, we have a microcontroller unit here that communicates with the LoRa module over SPI. And it also communicates with the sensor and amplifier circuitry. So the operation of this is when gas is detected, when gas is not detected and the device is in the field, it is simply sleeping. The LoRa module is completely powered down and the microcontroller is completely sleeping as well. The sensor and amp amplifier circuitry is operating and it is just simply waiting there to detect gas. The way this is designed is later on, I'll uh, speak a little bit more on it, but it will send a signal to the microcontroller when it does detect gas. That is the event that we're looking for in this whole system. And that is what drives the messages um, between the microcontroller and the rest of the system. So when that event occurs, the MCU um, will come out of its sleep state it will prepare a message, it will wake up the LoRa module out of its sleep state, and it will send it across the network. Um, during development, we used uh, two main microcontroller units. The first one was a TNC 3.6 development board for um, initial development. This is a pretty high powered uh, Cortex M4F processor, ARM 32 bit ARM processor. Uh, for lower power, we later switched to, the, to an STM32 uh, low power processor, specifically designed for low power operation, um, special sleep modes. And you can see that here. So we made a custom PCB for this uh, low power processor. This allowed us to optimize a little bit for low power design. We have um, direct inputs for power to avoid any regulator losses, and we use a different power system elsewhere in the system. And we can connect it. We can avoid any sort of like LEDs or any power consuming devices that use power constantly. So the sensor device, also called the end node again, is consisting of also the LoRa radio. And so the LoRa radio, this is very important. Uh, so we developed with a uh, an Adafruit module called the RFM95W. It's actually a Hope RF module. This is important because it is FCC and IC certified already, and the design is, as you can see, shielded on this little um, PCB here. It's easy to implement into designs, it's quick, and it provides um, the hardware that we need, the, all the certifications that we may need. Uh, we don't need to certify any custom designs that we make. Internally, it uses a Semtech SX1276 radio. This radio, um, provided by Semtech, uh, get, provides the uh, LoRa modulation in hardware for us. And it's operating on the 915 megahertz carrier frequency. Here you can see just um, some testing that we were doing with the LoRa modules set up on the table and the full end nodes actually assembled here, just on development boards. So still talking about the sensor, uh, there's the analog circuitry. This wasn't not designed by me. However, just a quick overview will help kind of understand how the end node works. So this is what triggers the event, as I mentioned earlier, that um, starts the MCU and the messages. Essentially, the, the sensor, it's made up of a sensor, uh, amplifier, and a comparator as the main portions. The sensor detects changes in resistance based on gas detection. 
and the amplifier amplifies that until the comparator outputs either a logic high or a logic low to the microcontroller. And the logic high is what um, starts off the events. So on to the gateway device. So the gateway device is always on, it has to be, and it's listening for lower messages from end nodes. Um, it takes any messages that it receives from the field and it forwards them to server-side software. And it's placed at the edge of the field, which means that it has fewer constraints on size, fewer constraints on power consumption. There's also only one of them. So this is what allows it to be always on and listening for LoRa messages. And here's a prototype gateway device that we designed. So it uses a LTE development board, the LTE, an LTE, um, Boron LTE module right here, which you can see. Internally, this uses a Ublox SAR R410 LTE modem, and it's on the LTE CAT M1 network on AT&T. In addition, this development board contains um, an NRF MCU on the board. However, this MCU was only used to pass information to the modem because it's higher power than the one that we're using to receive our LoRa messages. And sleeping it for the majority of the time saves more power than uh, simply using this microcontroller to interface directly with the LoRa module and helps with power consumption. In addition, you can see here um, in our prototype, we have this powered by just a simple lithium battery and USB charging, uh, fairly straightforward. So um, we also have an always on STM32 MCU. This connects, here's the little block diagram. This connects to the LoRa module back here. This is what's always listening. And as soon as the MCU receives a message, it wakes up the uh, higher power LTE development board. It sends the message to the board over UART and the uh, LTE board forwards that to the internet. And the specific protocols and communication used for that uh, will be covered later. So communication. The communication protocol is one of the main, uh, the main pieces of this project. It's important that the, the protocol is reliable and that we build upon the layers properly in order to get uh, communication between the LoRa modules and the node to the gateway device and to the internet. So we'll start from the bottom of the stack here and we'll start just at the LoRa mo module with the hardware. So the actual chip and communication protocol of LoRa has two main adjustable parameters um, in addition to generally the general adjustable like bandwidth and such that comes with other radios. That's the spreading factor and the coding rate. Uh, these are just little snippets out of the data sheet. Essentially, the spreading factor can allow for a longer range um, over with LoRa modules at the cost of a bit rate. And the coding rate is a forward CRC that can also help if there's any interference between the signals. So in our chip, in this implementation that I designed, uh, the spreading factor is set to 12, which is the longest range, and the coding factor is set to four out of five. However, this is essentially the lowest coding rate that we have here. You can see in this little table that the data sheet provides uh, the overhead of this forward CRC. And this coding rate by the chip is changed on the fly when the interference is detected. It's essentially sent with the packet header. And that's how the um, receiving chip knows to knows what the coding rate is. And so this helps with interference. Um, because our spreading factor is set so high, because we're trying to achieve the longest range, our bit rate is not very high. It's about 300 bits per second. And this will lower with different coding rates as well. Um, you can see from this chart, it's around 300 bits per second. And the packets that are sent um, can be up to 255 bits. So as you can see, these transmissions can last for a little while. The radio packet format, this is what is also given by the hardware in the data sheet. Uh, the preamble, there's a preamble, um, a header, uh, the payload, and the CRC. The protocol that I payload of this packet. 
the um, processing of the rest of this, so the preamble and the header is done by the actual chip itself. The preamble is a little signal. It's just a constant a one zero waveform and it allows the receiving chip to kind of latch onto the signal and um, understand that it's receiving an actual signal. This is set to 12, simply um, 12 bits for the preamble. This is because it's a lower bit rate. And so uh, increasing that to high values can cause, can just mean that the message is on the air for much longer times, uses more power and doesn't have a significant advantage for us. Um, there's no frequency hopping being done in this implementation. Messages are super short and there's only one message at a time. And in addition, these messages are sent very, very infrequently by the hardware. Uh, theoretically, in the field, gas detection will only happen a maximum of maybe four to five times. And so these messages aren't um, on the air very frequently or for long periods of time. Now, in this packet um, provided by the chip, the header contains the payload length and the coding rate and the CRC, and then also is always transmitted with the max coding rate. So essentially the way this works is the lower module will transmit, will begin to transmit this packet. It will transmit the preamble. Then it will transmit um, a short header at the max coding rate. The receiving chip will then read this. It will know how much data is in the packet from the payload length. And it will also know what, it'll also know what the coding rate is for the payload. Now this is sent with the maximum coding rate. So make sure that it's always the most reliable. Um, if we go back to this slide, you can see because it's a forward CRC, there's some overhead. And so uh, it has an overhead of two, actually. And we'll lower the bit rate. However, if that's not necessary for the payload, then um, the coding rate can be lowered and the message can be sent slightly faster. So on to the communication protocol built on top of the chip packet. Um, just some background, nodes must always be sleeping, as we said, which means we cannot use a fully mesh network for this. In order to have a fully mesh network uh, with hops between nodes, nodes would have to constantly be listening for messages. And instead we need a point to point communication. Uh, we need messages to be able to transmit from any sensor node straight to the gateway. Uh, the messages must be reliably delivered to the gateway. Uh, they'll be sent very infrequently, as I mentioned, and need to work in all sorts of conditions. So the protocol for the data that we're um, sending, uh, we've used, I've used, utilized a library that implements a small layer on top of the physical layer. It adds um, addressing, a header for addressing and reception acknowledgments. It also adds collision detecting, C collision detection, and it does this by waiting until it doesn't detect anything on the transmitting on the air before it sends before it sends data. And on top of that, a custom connection-based protocol was designed. And this is um, some of the bulk of the work for this project. So it's really important that this protocol is gotten right in order to achieve the reliable communication that we need. It contains uh, mostly application layer and some transport and session layer details. And it defines just how messages are sent between uh, a node and a gateway. It allows, because it's connection-based, it allows multiple messages to be sent without interruption. This allows for longer, bigger data sizes, and it can help with the lower bit rates. Um, it also defines message sizes, data formats, um, failures, send actions, and more. So here is the custom protocol uh, payload structure. So if we go back to the simple packet structure here. The custom protocol data is put inside of this payload. And so this is the layer on top of that. There are two bytes of overhead, simply one byte of flags, uh, and then one byte for the origin address. And this is important for later. And then there's the data. Uh, the protocol uh, essentially works on, as a connection-based protocol. So nodes attempts to make a connection with the gateway. Once connection is made, the gateway can then exclusively process data from this connection, denying connections from other nodes. This helps with reliability, especially since the bit rate is so slow. 
Um, there can be several other nodes possibly trying to send data at once. Even though data is sent infrequently by sensors, it could be possible that sensors detect um, gas at the same time and may have um, collisions. One of the most important parts of this protocol is the failure to send protocol. So essentially what this means is if a message fails to send from a node, then this protocol handles resending that message. And the way that works is just to simply resend the message after a random amount of time during a specified interval. Uh, this interval doubles after each retry up to an hour. So if there is a problem and a node can't send a message, it will retry at a random time, not only to avoid collisions with um, other nodes that may be sending, but also to help with environmental factors. Uh, so this could help with reliable transmissions if it's unable to send to due to conditions. Say there is rain or fog at a certain hour and the node can't send at that moment. Um, these, this resend protocol allows it to be to reach pry uh, after a while, after possible condition, conditions have cleared up, or maybe the base node was interrupted by a piece of equipment, anything like that. This helps with reliable transmissions and is one of the main important portions of um, this project. If, these, if this protocol wasn't used, then messages, even though there's collision detection and other um, acknowledgments implemented by lower layers, messages may still just be stopped immediately and they may not ever get through to the base. This could mean that the farmer never receives their notification about damage in the grass or um, in their crops and could cause essentially just crops to be lost for a season. So this is very important. Now this protocol also designs into it uh, message relaying. So this is a super basic uh, message relaying and it kind of operates on the same principle that mesh does, which is just sending a message to one node and that node relays it to another node. However, this is uh, more basic than mesh. And it also allows for nodes to operate not constantly on. The end node can send, can be off its entire life until it needs to send a message where it can send it directly to the base. However, if the node is out of range, relayed nodes can be placed in between the um, base or the gateway node and the end node. These relay nodes must re are required to be always on because they're always constantly listening for messages from end nodes. Uh, and essentially the end node will just send its message that it wants for the, to go to the base to this relay node. This node will forward it to the base. Anything that the base receives goes to the relay node and then back to the end node. Uh, very simple and can is designed to nearly double the range um, of these messages and can help with larger farms um, or conditions that are suboptimal that the node can't communicate well in reliably. So we worked with uh, researchers at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln to do some field testing. And this communication protocol and whole end node system was tested. So the communication was tested with different um, 915 megahertz antennas at different distances across the field. And the field corn measured about five and a half feet tall uh, while we were testing this. And so these are the three different these three on the left were the three different antennas we tested, just a simple um, stubby wire coil antenna. And we actually found that the communication between the wire and this um, stubby antenna was very similar. And that the biggest factor was in the lower communication was actually the height from the ground. Uh, it's important to note that if the node, the end node is sitting on the physical ground, next to the crops, especially while they're this tall and full of water, that communication uh, could be very poor and interference is high. So this was all tested at a height, at about waist height, around three to four feet off the ground. And we were able to make it across the entire field. So here's the field and you can see it's about 370 meters. This red dot is where the gateway node was placed. And then this blue dot was where we tested various positions. Uh, right. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So can I go back for one slide? Sure. 
Uh, yeah, could you explain a little bit more on the meaning of the numbers shown here? Oh, sure. This is the percentage of the RSI signal. So uh, essentially, the RSSI, uh, which is the signal strength uh, at its most basic form, between the gateway and the end node was measured next to each other, so within a couple meters. And then they, these percentage values are the percentage of that signal strength as we uh, went across the field testing the communication and the protocol. So all that means is that as we traverse through the field, you can see at 150 meters to 208 meters that the um, signal strength decreased. And these are just relative signal strengths. And as we got across the field all the way to 370 meters, uh, we found it to be unstable and have about a 5% signal strength at the end of the field. And so that 370 meters is across this full distance from this red dot to this far blue dot, uh, where we had a where we were able to communicate across the full field, but it was still unstable. Uh, and then there's a small video just of us in the field. That's uh, Ravi Mural and Shakir Khan. And then here is some of our setup. So you can see these are some base nodes that we were testing using um, a USB battery bank to power them, or some end nodes, excuse me, to, that we were testing. And you can see the different antennas that we had connected to the nodes. So this little coil right here is an antenna. This blue part is LoRa module, then that's the microcontroller. This is just the battery bank we're using to power them. And you can see here's some data that we were receiving from the base node. And here's the gateway node or the base node um, connected through LTE. And so this was the real, the first real test of the system in a field. And this proved that the protocol was working reliably. Um, the wireless communications was working reliably and everything up to the base and the server software was working reliably. And here is the view of the field that we were actually testing in. And you can see the height of the corn. Um, that we were testing about six feet and also how green it was. This is about the worst conditions uh, that would be for the lower module to be transmitting through because the corn was so tall and full of water. I had the greatest interference for the radios. So moving on to the gateway communication. So MQTT is a uh, communication protocol and to stand it's used to send the data to the internet from the gateway node. It's a pretty widely used standard protocol for IoT messages. It's built upon a publish subscribe model and it's pretty lightweight and easy to implement. What this means is that when the gateway node receives a message, it will publish it to a certain address. And from that address, um, any subscribers so any devices that also are using the MQTT protocol and are subscribed to this certain address can receive this message. This allows us to implement uh, programs that can receive notifications in real time of when data comes through. And in addition, because this is so lightweight and easy to implement, uh, it, it was very straightforward on the embedded system side to implement and made the firmware simple. So for the server-side software, we will go back to a quick overview of the full system. So here is the full system, uh, just as a visualized view of it. And this is what we were testing in the field. So uh, it consists of the nodes over here that are sitting in the field that communicate across LoRa. When their events are driven, uh, they send messages across the base node, so to the gateway. This gateway then takes these messages, feeds them through the LTE modem, and then across the internet using the MQTT protocol to a server. Now for the server-side software, we have the MQTT server. We have an um, intermediate program that's subscribed to any of these messages and will store data in a, data, a database. We also have any external clients. We did not use any other clients besides this program, but it is possible to have more clients. These could be anything such as network clients or um, phones, stuff like that. 
Um, this intermediate program was just a simple pro Python program that stored messages in this database. And now this database is one of the technologies that's also um, fairly special because this is a time series database. So it's essentially optimized for logging. And we used InfluxDB as a database and it interfaced well with our uh, web server. So uh, just as a quick overview, we have messages going across to this MQTT server. This gets goes through another program stored in the database. And then another program can be used to view these messages straight from the database. Um, this program is a web application uh, called Grafana. And this allows essentially collected data to be read from anywhere. Uh, super easy interface. And because it's a web application, you can use it on any platform, such as your phone, uh, regardless of operating system, uh, or any computer, regardless of operating system. This was hosted, or here's a quick example of the Grafana um, data that we see. So it, you can see that it tracks the time and the node, as well as the gateway ID where we received the messages. This can allow, once farmers actually place nodes, it can allow them to map the node number to the actual location on the farm so that they know where this problem is happening exactly. This makes it easy to see results and um, plot, track data trends, and share it with um, people should that be needed. Integrates a lot of technologies. So this was hosted on a DigitalOcean uh, droplet, which is a, essentially just a shared instance of cloud VM running Ubuntu uh, 2004 version. And it's run in the Docker container using Docker Compose for easy portability, maintenance, and versioning. So I know that's a lot, but here's one more overview of the system. Oh. Um, essentially, we have our end nodes. And this technology uses, utilizes LoRa to send messages to the gateway node. These nodes are constantly sleeping and event-driven. An event is when the sensor detects gas and notifies the microcontroller. These messages go across the internet, stored in a database, and are viewable on the web. So that brings me to the conclusion here of the presentation. Um, essentially, the full project integrates a lot of technologies. There's a lot of technology that goes into low-power IoT-based networking. We have an event-driven uh, microcontroller, uh, LoRa radios, the um, LTE modules, and modems, web applications, and other protocols such as MQTT. Now, the biggest portion of this project is that these connection is the connection-based LoRa protocol that allows for long-distance transmissions through several different conditions. It's a new use of um, new technology. Requires exploration um, new protocol and for new protocols and new uses of it. Um, that is my presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions that I can take or any slides that anybody would like to see again? Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. So any questions from the audience? Okay, so if there's no uh, questions, then we can end up here.